So again, thank you very much. Being thank free. you, Grigoris. Thank you for the kind invitation to present some data that have just been published in Leukemia one week before. So they are very, very new. One from uh, mainly from the EMN regarding the management of multi myeloma patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, these are my disclosures. Just to mention that uh, we had published uh, the uh, ESMO uh, guidelines three years before, and we are going to update them now uh, for the treatment of uh, multiple myeloma. And uh, you can see for patients who are eligible for transplant, newly diagnosed patients, uh, the induction treatment is based in triplets based on bortezomib. So they are going to be Belcade, thalidomide, dexamethasone, or cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone with Belcade, or uh, lenalidomide with Belcade and dexamethasone, which is the triplet of choice for now, followed by autologous transplant and lenalidomide maintenance. Just uh, to mention here from the thrombotic point of view that lenalidomide is a thrombogenic uh, drug. Multiple myeloma is also a disease with thrombogenic potential. So you understand that during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we have uh, severe problems with that. And also for those patients who are not eligible for transplant, if you can see these are in the different uh, uh, treatment regimen, which is lenalidomide, suggests also that lenalidomide is a major component of the treatment of multiple myeloma. Regarding the treatment of uh, relapsed or refractory setting, I think also here that we have a lot of regimens that include lenalidomide, uh, like uh, uh, here, as you can see, for those patients who had received bortezomib up front in different combinations with daratumumab, which is a monoclonal antibody targeting CD38, or with tacfizomib, ixazomib, both are proteasome inhibitors, or elotuzumab, which is another monoclonal antibody targeting SLAMP7. So you can see that lenalidomide, which has a uh, thrombogenic potential, is uh, a key drug for the treatment of multiple myeloma, and it belongs to the immunomodulatory drugs uh, category, like pomalidomide, which is also uh, a drug that is used after the second or subsequent relapse. So we have a disease that, first of all, has thrombogenic potential, and we use a lot of drugs that also have thrombogenic potential. You discussed a lot about uh, the uh, COVID virus uh, or the SARS-CoV-2 virus, you want to be more correct, that mainly affects the immune system, although it seems that it affects almost every tissue and organ in our body. So I'm not going to go into details of that, but I'm going to stress the hematologic findings and complications of the COVID-19. This was a paper that we produced with Grigoris and Thanos Dimopoulos uh, at, uh, a couple of months before and was published in American Journal of Hematology, where we have uh, summarized all the data that were available till that day. And uh, as you all know, lymphopenia is considered as a cardiac laboratory finding with prognostic potential for the COVID-19 infection. While we do know that all the inflammatory indices, including LDA, CRP, and interleukin 6, may help to identify cases with this one prognosis. Furthermore, other biomarkers like the high serum procalcitonin and ferritin have also emerged as poor prognostic factors, while we do know that blood hypercoagulability is common among the hospitalized COVID 19 patients. Regarding that, we have seen that not only we have elevated D-dimers that are consistently reported in all patients that uh, have been uh, hospitalized or have been intubated in the ICU units, but also the elevated D-dimers correlate with uh, disease worsening. Furthermore, disseminated intravascular coagulation, which necessitates continuous vigilance and home intervention, is life-threatening and often seen in patients with COVID-19. So for these reasons, pharmacological thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin is not only highly recommended, but it is a standard of care now for the hospitalized patients with COVID-19. If we have all these into consideration, so we have some questions regarding multiple myeloma patients, but also patients with other malignancy. So one of the questions is, do we have data uh, at the time that uh, we produced, uh, the, the ASCO produced these, uh, talked about Italy and China, because these were the two major countries that had 
problems. But even the US also uh, has the same problem. UK and other countries do have any data about the risk of COVID-19 infection in temporarily neutropenic patients, like uh, in cancer patients, so myeloma patients also. Is the risk increased for uh, the patients that go through a period of five or 10 days of neutropenia between the different cycles of chemo? So we have very, very few data on, uh, on that. And there is a Lancet Ecology paper by Young and colleagues who report a prospective cohort of more than 1,500 patients with COVID-19 18 of which had a prior history of cancer. And this paper described that patients with a history of cancer had a higher incidence of severe events defined as the percentage of patients admitted to an intensive care unit requiring invasive ventilation or death compared with other patients. I think that uh, based on what we know about the COVID, a major question is if we are going to change the therapy to minimize visits in hospital, so are we going to change, for example, intravenous to oral drugs in order to have less frequent regimens? And how frequently are we giving, for example, drugs that we use for bone, uh, bone prophylaxis like zoledronic acid? So the American Society of Hematology produced guidelines that uh, you can find them uh, in the uh, website of the American Society of Hematology. They have not been uh, published in a journal which suggests that whenever possible, it is recommended to use weekly and oral regimens. And uh, many times, outpatient visits for treatment are restricted to patients who benefits of the multidrug non-oral regimens are expected to outweigh the risk, mainly in uh, countries where the COVID-19 uh, has a, a pandemic, and that there are a lot of cases, or in local hospitals. The European Myeloma Network has just produced, as I previously mentioned, uh, the guidelines for the treatment of uh, myeloma and uh, precursor diseases like monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance or smoldering myeloma. Uh, the paper was online on the 22nd of May, so it was uh, three weeks before, and um, uh, is in leukemia. So according to the uh, experts of the European Myeloma Network, we suggest that patients with um, MGAS or smoldering myeloma that are typically in long-term follow-up uh, and uh, who can monitor their disease status uh, based uh, many times on uh, uh, telemedicine techniques and uh, the scheduled visit of the patients with the stable disease can be safely delayed. Alternative blood examination in local laboratories in consultation via telemedicine is strongly encouraged. Regarding general recommendations for myeloma patients, because we are continuing to see newly diagnosed patients in the COVID pandemic, in countries or local communities where the COVID-19 infection is widely spread, the multiple myeloma patients should have a PCR test of nasopharyngeal swab for the SARS-CoV-2 virus before hospital admission, starting a new treatment line, cell apheresis or autologous transplantation that as I previously mentioned, it is the standard of care for newly diagnosed patients up to the age of 70, in order to avoid world spread and infections. In cases of myeloma patients with positive PCR test for the virus, but with no symptoms for COVID-19 infection, a 14-day quarantine should be considered if myeloma-related events allow the delay of treatment. The problem is that many times we have myeloma patients with aggressive disease, for example, with acute renal impairment, with extended bone disease, with fractures, severe anemia, or other features of aggressive disease, and who cannot delay treatment. So for those patients who have no symptoms, and they have such an aggressive uh, uh, development, like acute renal failure, we suggest that the treatment has to be uh, has not to be delayed. And of course, we have to be very, very careful about the symptoms of COVID-19. Otherwise, if the patient has COVID-19 symptoms, the treatment um, uh, has to be delayed until the total recovery from the infection. As a, otherwise, this should be given very, very close monitor of the patient for a development of COVID-19 signs and symptoms. So we have um, the problem of uh, patients who are doing the test, we have seen that the test is positive and um, because of the aggressive presentation of the disease, we have to decide to, to give treatment and of course this has 
risks. But on the other hand, we talk about a disease that is uh, fatal in many patients. Treatment should not be delayed for newly diagnosed patients with uh, active disease, of course, if they are PCR negative, and the induction treatment can be administered for an extended period for up to six to eight cycles. For those who do not treat multiple myeloma, we have to say that they initially we give four cycles of induction treatment before the transplant, and then we go to autologous transplant. So for the pandemic um, uh, period, we suggest that these four cycles can be extended to six to eight cycles. And if the pandemic is a little bit lower in the area, then after uh, the use of cortezomib-based triplets or even quadruple that has been just uh, licensed in the uh, EU, like daratumumab with VTD, Belcate, Thalidomide, and Dexamethasone, then uh, if we don't have the pandemic, we can go on with the transplant. But if we are in the middle of a pandemic situation, then we have to postpone mobilization, stem cell heart rate, conditioning, and total boost transplant, mainly in patients with standard risk disease. For patients uh, uh, who have a high risk disease, then I think that after six to eight sites of autologous transplant, then we have to go to the transplant conditioning and uh, treatment because otherwise the high risk disease is going to be uh, very difficult for our patients to be handled. In case of close contact with a person diagnosed with COVID-19, the stem cell harvest and any transplant procedure should not be performed within at least 14 and preferably 21 days from the last contact. And patients who are in the maintenance phase of their treatment should continue with their oral regimen and reduce the visit to the clinic. Just to mention that the only uh, regimen that has been approved for maintenance in Europe is lenalidomide. So uh, if we give lenalidomide in the oral regimen and we go follow up the patient uh, through telemedicine, but if the patient receives a cutaneous bortezomib as a maintenance, although it's not been registered, is used a lot, uh, in countries mainly that lenalidomide is not available, we have um, either to delay uh, the treatment, or especially if the depth of response uh, till the pandemic uh, uh, development is a uh, very good partial response or more. Treatment of patients who are not eligible for transplant should be based in all oral regimens. We have lenalidomide and dexamethasone that have been approved, we have new drugs now, mainly combination with daratumumab, like daratumumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, or daratumumab with BMP. And for fit or intermediate fit myeloma patients, the RD can be considered as a bridge for two to three cycles in case of the COVID-19 pandemia is at the peak in a specific area or in hospital. Otherwise, the approved VRD or daratumumab-based therapy should be considered. Because as you can see, the D is always dexamethasone in our regimen. We don't have any regimen without dexamethasone up front. Then the dexamethasone should be reduced to 20 mg weekly, whereas the escalation should be considered for responding patients, especially after the completion of nine cycles of treatment. Regarding relapse, we have to treat only clinical relapse. Uh, there is a lot of debate in the myeloma community if we need to treat biochemical relapse only. But during the COVID-19 pandemic, I think that we have to treat only the clinical relapse. Uh, if there are orally administered regimens, then this has been to consider, for example, ixazomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. Ixazomib is a normal progesterone inhibitor. So uh, this triplet, I think, is very good for this pandemic. But the treatment uh, for patients who are already on a specific uh, uh, regimen, which includes bortezomib or carfilzomib or daratumumab, then for those who receive twice weekly bortezomib, I think that we can go to once weekly, similar with carfilzomib, but I'm going to give you some data on that. And daratumumab has to be given monthly. So you can see here with the different uh, regimens that we use based on lenalidomide as triplets in multiple myeloma, like DAR-RD, LORD, carfilzomib rd Ixazomib with lenalidomide and dexamethasone, Daratumab with Belcade and dexamethasone. You can see the hospital visits that you need to have for this patient. And you can see for the oral regimen, IRD, you have to see your patient monthly compared to KRD, that the patient has to come six times per month in the hospital 
because of the IV use of carfilzomib twice weekly. So, uh, because we have that, I believe that IRD is a very good combination that can be used. And uh, we have now data from the UK, Czech, and Greece. This is a combined uh, uh, study of real-world data suggesting that um, in 155 patients uh, with relapsed refractory disease with one median prior line of treatment, the overall response rate is uh, 74%. And I just mentioned in this paper, we compared, because we had exactly the same follow-up for patients um, who participated in the study with the patients who participated in the Turmaline 1 study. This was the study that gave approval to the IRD combination. And you can see here with the red color, the uh, IRD PFS of the Turmaline study that I mentioned is the phase three study that gave approval to the combination of exazomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. And with the blue color, you can see our population. Uh, this graph was produced by the same statisticians who produced the Turmaline MM1 data. And you can see that the two curves are totally uh, super impossible, uh, su suggesting uh, that uh, in the real world, you expect with IRT what you have read in the New England Journal of Medicine paper for a triplet combination. Regarding carfilzomib, that is given twice uh, weekly. So for three weeks, we have uh, Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, and then one week without the drugs, so six visits for the hospital. We had a study which compared this twice weekly carfilzomib schedule that you can see here with a once weekly carfilzomib. Uh, with the increase of the dose from 27 to 70 milligram. And you can see that the weekly dose uh, compared to the previous approved dose of 27 milligram per square meter twice per week had a better median PFS of 11.2 versus 7.6 months. So the once weekly, at least we know that uh, is uh, uh, better compared to the twice weekly 27 milligram. Of course, for those who are familiar with the treatment of multiple myeloma, the new dose of the twice weekly now carfilzomib that have been used as monotherapy is 52 milligram per square meter. So uh, we don't know if the 70 milligram once weekly is uh, comparable to the 52 milligram uh, every um, uh, twice per week. But at least we do know that we have a study that showed to us that the median PFS is around one year for those who receive weekly carfilzomib. The real-world data comparing VRD, KRD, and IRD, for those who are not familiar, I want to say that uh, all these three uh, protesome inhibitors, bortezomib, carfilzomib, and ixazomib, are given as subcutaneous infusion, the velcade, intravenous, carfilzomib, and oral tablet is the ixazomib in combination with oral drugs like lenalidomide and dexamethasone. And you can see here that in the real-world practice, it seems that in the whole population, IRD seems to be a little bit better compared to the others. But if we see uh, into deep analysis, you can see that for the fit patient, the combination of KRD produced the best results with the pink color, as you can see here, compared to VRD and IRD. But we, when we go to the frail and intermediate frail patient, then the KRD is not doing well. And this is mainly because of the side effects of carfilzomib that includes hypertension and cardiac dysfunction. If you can see this uh, real-world data, what's happening between uh, three uh, protesome inhibitors in combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone, you can see, for example, if you compare IRD with VRD, the IRD favors in those who had a prior exposure to thalidomide and lenalidomide, and in those with high-risk cytogenetics compared to VRD. If you compare IRD and KRD, you can see that the IRD has only um, an advantage in those with prior IMID exposure. In all the other categories, KRD is better. So we do recognize for that KRD can, cannot be stopped in patients who receive it and they are fit enough to receive it. But probably we can go to once weekly. And KRD compared to VRD, you can see in all categories that they are analyzed regarding PFS, so high risk of genetic, symptomatic relapse, prior transplant history, KRD was found better compared to VRD. 
Another important issue, and I was that I want to close with that, is the thromboprophylaxis during the IMED administration, like lenalidomide, thalidomide, and pomalidomide. As you have understood, lenalidomide is a major drug that we use in all uh, treatment lines for multiple myeloma. Yeah, first line, second line with different combinations. Lenalidomide is a thrombogenic drug, and because of that, the European and other uh, societies like the International Myeloma Foundation has suggested that all patients who receive lenalidomide has to receive thromboprophylaxis, either with low molecular weight heparin or aspirin, uh, based on the risk of the patient. For the three first months, everybody suggests low molecular weight heparin, but then many physicians uh, 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 stop the low molecular weight heparin administration and uh, continue only on aspirin. However, because of uh, thrombogenic potential of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and uh, during pandemic, we suggest that for the countries with high incidence of COVID-19, the low molecular weight heparin may be considered over aspirin or thromboprophylaxis in myeloma patients under IMID administration, irrespective of their thrombotic risk. Regarding the use of low molecular weight heparin in myeloma patients with asymptomatic COVID-19, or with mild symptoms not requiring hospitalization, even in the absence of IME administration, there was a lot of, uh, of debate between the authors of the paper. So we say uh, politically that several ongoing trials will reveal the prophylaxis value, although I have to say that it was half and half. So half of the authors suggest that even in the absence of IME administration, if a patient is positive for COVID-19 and receives other antimyeloma therapy, the patients have to receive a low molecular. So to conclude, in, during the pandemic, the treatment of multiple myeloma has to be in such a way, the schedule, in order to reduce the hospital visits in order um, to balance the efficacy and safety. The PCR testing is uh, suggested for all newly diagnosed myeloma patients and all patients who start a new line of treatment. We have to use more oral drugs, if possible, to postpone the autologous transplant in standard risk patients. The maintenance with oral drugs can be continued. And in case of COVID-19 infection, we have to follow the local guidelines. Uh, there is no data regarding COVID-19 uh, treatment in myeloma patients today. There is only one published patient to date. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to have questions. Thank you, Professor Terpos, for this uh, overview on the myeloma and the COVID. I have three questions. One, the first one is, if you consider that patients on multiple myeloma are in lower risk to develop uh, COVID, uh, severe COVID disease. First of all, we don't have any, uh, uh, we don't have any data uh, on that. As you have seen, there are very, very few... Uh, reported cases. In our department, we have 2,000 myeloma patients. We don't have not even one case to date um, with COVID-19. So I'm not in a position to say that the, the patients, because of the treatment that they receive, are at lower risk based on the use of immunomodulatory drugs or progesterone inhibitors, although so there are some publications suggesting the use of these drugs for COVID-19, but these patients have not myeloma. There were normal patients who had COVID-19 infection. So we don't have such data that's why the European Library led by uh, Gordon Cook from the United Kingdom in order to uh, manage from all the European countries to have all patients with myeloma and COVID-19 and check that they are used and Second uh, question. Second, uh, is uh, if you advise to switch all the patients who are on aspirin to switch them to low molecular weight heparin? For me, uh, this is what we are doing in our department. We are giving low molecular weight heparin. I'm, uh, uh, although I'm the first author of the, of the, of the guidelines, I, um, I, I, I try to persuade all the others to, to follow this suggestion. We were half and half. We are 17 authors and uh, was nine, nine, eight, the score. Um, some of them, they are afraid a little bit of uh, the use of low molecular weight heparin for a prolonged uh, duration because we give them a little mind, for example, in maintenance phase at least for two years. Uh, but I strongly believe that even without lenalidomide, because of the thrombogenic potential in 
countries where there are a lot of COVID-19 uh, cases, but even in countries like Greece that we don't have a lot of COVID-19, I will feel safer not to give uh, aspirin and to have low molecular weight heparin as thromboprophylaxis for both myeloma and IMIDs. And the third uh, is uh, that if you think that the application of the strict, strict lockdown in Greece uh, had a negative impact on the survival or the recurrence uh, probability in patients with myeloma who did not follow apparently the, the schedule. First of all, you know that um, the Greeks in general are emotional people. So I mean that they are afraid a lot of, uh, of the disease, of cancer. So the cancer patients, not only myeloma patients, are probably they were locked in their houses. They are very, very frightened because of the COVID-19. And uh, they followed the, the government rules very strictly. Probably it is the same. But I think that at least for the South European countries where the people are more emotional, I mean that they uh, follow the rules uh, more. However, we have to say, on the other hand, as a general comment, is that the one week of difference between the lockdown in Greece and in Belgium, for example, I don't know if this can give you the explanation for the 9,000 deaths in Belgium. I talked for a country with a similar population as Greece, and the 180 deaths in Greece. So probably uh, there was probably the virus was in the community, better community for example, and it was not recognized. So it's not only lockdown, it's only the recognition of the virus uh, before. And of course, in Greece, uh, we had uh, the pictures coming from Italy, and there was every night in the uh, television. And of course, this also created a lot of fear, uh, not only for the myeloma patients, but for all the community in order to follow the measures. I don't know if there are also genetic uh, conditions, uh, polymorphisms of the uh, uh, of the AC2 receptor for the virus. I don't know all these things, but uh, of course, this is a matter of uh, research from the infection disease uh, uh, people. However, because I am doing the, the study with the plasma, convalescent plasma in Greece, I participate in this study and I have examined a lot of uh, donors, more than 250. Um, we can see that um, the virus has a totally different picture within the family. So, for example, I had a family that I've seen today, four members. The father was near intubation, the mother was a flu like uh, syndrome, and the two children, 29 and 18 years of age, since the 28th of March and 10th of April, they have only one day of fever, 37.6, only one day, and totally loss of smell now since that period of time, so more than two months, that continue to, to persist. So in a family of four, that we have four different clinical pictures of the disease uh, that shows also the heterogeneity of the disease, but also... Um, it, it's kind of difficult it's going to be in order to manage to control it. I don't know if I answered the question. I talked a lot about that. But the message, I think the message that, is that uh, the lockdown did not affect the management of the case. I believe that at least only the lockdown, only. Uh, it's not the only reason. Yeah, of course, it plays a role. Otherwise, do not. But I believe that it's not the only reason that we had such a good picture. This is my opinion, of course. I cannot you prove that. For, uh, but from the, what I told, I think that um, you you may have the same uh, conclusion. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Telfos. Thank you so much. Very glad thank you. To be with you today. Thank you very much. So.